From Embark's headquarters in Dallas, Texas, this is Accounting Matters, an accounting podcast powered by Embark. Hi, hello, good afternoon. It's great to be with each of you. I'm Zach Smith, Embark's East Region Market President, and I'm joined with my co-host, Adam Olson, Embark's Accounting Advisory Practice Leader. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing carbon emissions accounting with Fabian Garavito, a senior manager in Embark Sustainability Practice. Fabian, Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us, Zach. Glad to be here. Yeah. So Fabian, before we even get started, talk to me a little bit about your passion and how you got into sustainability and why you're a part of Embark Sustainability's practice. Yeah. So sustainability is a big thing nowadays. There is a lot of movement around it in the investor world. It's driving a lot of investors' decisions. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's going to be a big force in the market. And I really wanted to just learn it, pick it up and run with it. And it seemed like a really good career opportunity for me uh, personally and just to learn something new and, and truly, hopefully make a difference out there through uh, better reporting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great way too for just a lot of accountants out there to use their existing kind of reporting skill sets that they, you know, use for traditional accounting and, and, and translate that into how we now report on, you know, different carbon type measures and other things related to sustainability. Yeah, yep. I love it. Well, Adam, let's go ahead and get things kicked off with you and discuss okay. some of the basics. Sure. Uh, what exactly is meant by carbon accounting? And is that even the right term that we should be using? Yeah, so carbon accounting is actually, you know, it's a relatively new field as you know, Fabian was alluding to, and we've definitely seen kind of an increase in stakeholder demand for this type of information. So just in popularity, carbon accounting has become a, more of like a household name. Um, but at its core, it is very similar to financial reporting itself, um, where carbon accounting looks to quantify kind of the impacts that, you know, an organization has on the environment, the climate around it, both directly and indirectly. So you'll often hear carbon accounting referred to sometimes as greenhouse gas accounting, so GHG accounting, or you'll hear it referred to as just sustainability accounting, you know, other other names thrown around in, in practice. But it's really, it, you know, it's become more important because if you kind of look around the globe, you see so many companies out there that are now trying to reduce their own carbon footprint. People are setting goals and targets out there to reach certain net zero um, carbon emissions by you know X date. And so carbon accounting really serves as a way to actually measure um, how a company or even an individual can be held accountable for trying to achieve those goals. And, and we'll talk a lot more about that today, but you know companies are often setting certain baselines. They create targets for when they want to reduce the emissions by. And then like I said, they're they're finding ways to track that and carbon accounting really kind of sets the framework to do that in a manner that's going to be consistent, comparable. Um, and really transparent for people that want to understand that information. Yeah. And Adam, you said that, you know, carbon accounting is a relatively new field. When did this concept come to fruition? Yeah, so modern day carbon accounting, I think you can probably date back to kind of the turn of the century. And by that, I mean, 2001. Um, and that's really when uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Corporate Standard, which a lot of people refer to as the protocol, was originally published. And so the put forth of the greenhouse gas protocol really kind of created the first comprehensive global standardized framework that's used for measuring and managing emissions. Um, and this is for both for private and public sectors, um, companies, their value chains, the products they produce, buy, sell, um, as well as the policies they implement. And so the protocol also provided structure around how an organization categorizes its emissions. So they came up with kind of what you'll hear for, referred to as the different scopes of emissions. So scopes one, two, and three. And we'll we'll talk a bit more about that today. Um, and since the greenhouse gas protocol in or 2001, we've seen a lot of other initiatives that have been just further perpetuating the need for carbon accounting. Um, and, and just understanding emissions globally. And, and one of the you know more recent ones was in 2015 when you know globally numerous countries joined the Paris Agreement um, and collectively signed an international treaty that really focused on climate change. Since the Paris Agreement, there's been other kind of regulatory and like authoritative type guidance that's been put forth. Um, the the Paris Agreement really kind of spearheaded the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures, um, which TCFD you'll hear about referred to in practice. 
Um, that was a direct follow-up from the Paris Agreement. And again, that really just helped establish more recommendations and another framework for the types of information that companies um, should be disclosing to their key stakeholders. Um, and then even subsequent to that, like we've talked about on other you know episodes of this podcast and in our AM Now discussion, you know, there's a number of different just climate related, sustainability related reporting standards and rulemaking that's in progress now. And so it's just further kind of perpetuating like the demand for this information. Okay. Now, Fabian, let's go ahead and circle back to you to actually what's at the center of carbon accounting and that's emissions. Talk to me a little bit about that and how we need to be thinking about this. Sure. Things. So when we're talking about the word emissions, we're really talking about greenhouse gas emissions. So this leads to two questions. What is a greenhouse gas? And then what do we mean by emissions? So greenhouse gases are gases that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this creates a warming effect on the planet's surface. Uh, when we're talking about emissions, emissions are substances that are emitted or released into the atmosphere. In this specific case, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the release of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is generally considered the result of human activities uh, like burning fossil fuels, right? Like driving your car or you can even uh, burn something in an oven, right? Just utilizing things like that on your daily life. Uh, it can also be electricity consumption, which is known as indirect emissions, heat generation, and then things like agriculture, livestock operations, and much more. While emissions may be the result of any type of greenhouse gas, the standard unit for measuring emissions is CO2, or otherwise known as a carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, meaning that other greenhouse gases are converted into a carbon dioxide equivalent, or CO2E, for purposes of carbon accounting. This conversion is done through a respective use of global warming potential factors. So a GWP, or global warming potential, is a measure of how much energy the emissions of a one ton of a gas will absorb over time relative to the emissions of one ton of carbon dioxide. So you're essentially converting the other greenhouse gases into an equivalent of CO2. Uh, it's, important, it's important to recognize that CO2 E is only used to simplify the accounting process, uh, as all greenhouse gases will have different degrees of warming impact. Okay, so lots of things to take in there. Um, so other than CO2, though, what are some of the other main forms of greenhouse gases that we sure. need to talk through? Sure. So uh, broadly, there are seven main types of greenhouse gases, mainly driven by the Kyoto Protocol. So that's going to be carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O. Those are the three main ones that the industry is really focusing on. And then you have fluorinated gases like hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, and nitrogen trifluoride. I'm like having a chemistry class. I was going to say, <laughs> I'm having flashbacks to 10th grade chemistry class, yeah. which I did not do yeah. well in. So uh, we'll leave it at that. You know, Fabian, talk to me a little bit about where, what are some of these major sources for greenhouse gases and, you know, potentially where they're coming from and some things that we need to think about there. Sure. So uh, greenhouse gas sources will vary by territory. They'll vary by developing countries, uh, developed countries. But here in the U.S., according to the EPA, there are six major sources of greenhouse gases. Uh, one of them is transportation, electricity production, industry, commercial and residential, agriculture, and then land use and forestry. So if we start from the top, transportation back in 2020, according to the EPA, uh, composed 27% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. So the transportation sector was the largest share of the greenhouse gas emissions. And greenhouse gas emissions from transportation primarily come from burning fossil fuel for, uh, fossil fuel for cars, trucks, ships, trains and planes. Over 90% of the fuel used for transportation is petroleum based, which includes primarily gasoline and diesel. So I, I'm not sure if you know this, but that's obviously, I would assume why a lot of these uh, car manufacturers are moving to electric vehicles, right? So this is there has to be another side effect of cutting down on the greenhouse gas emissions there from just an electric vehicle perspective, correct? Yeah. Uh, so then we just talked about transportation. Now we can move on to the second largest one, electricity production, which according to the EPA was about 25% of 2020 greenhouse gas emissions. So electricity power generates the second largest share of greenhouse gas emissions. Approximately 60% of power of our electricity comes from burning fossil fuels, primarily coal and natural gas. So it's important to note, though, that emissions from electricity are not created when you utilize electricity 
but at the point of production when combustion of natural gas or coal is occurring. Okay. Then we move on to industry. Industry is mainly greenhouse gas emissions from certain certain chemicals necessary to produce goods from raw materials, commercial and residential, uh, which is emissions from businesses and homes, primarily from fossil fuels burned for heat, uh, the use of certain products that can turn that contain greenhouse gases, and the handling of waste and agriculture. Greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture come from livestock such as cows, uh, agricultural soils, and rice production. Then we move to the last last one, land use and forestry, which makes up about 13% of greenhouse gases back in 2020. Land areas can act as a sink, meaning that they can absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, or they can be a source of greenhouse gas emissions. In the United States, since 1990, managed forests and other lands are a net sink, meaning that they absorbed more CO2 from the atmosphere than they actually emitted. Okay, so that's obviously a good thing and something that we'd want to uh, lean into, I would think. Adam, going back to you, um, I think this was all helpful context that Fabian just discussed, but if I'm a company wanting to or needing to start my carbon accounting journey, where do I even begin? Is that something that Embark can help us with? Uh, definitely something we can help you with, and it's it's obviously a very important question to ask. and. Like all things related to accounting, I think the first step is just figuring out what all you have. So we often refer to that as just inventorying your greenhouse gases. So figuring out what all kind of falls into the purview of the reporting organization, entity, company, whoever, um, to begin even then figuring out what we need to track, measure, and report on. And so kind of tying back to what we opened up talking about the greenhouse gas protocol, um, you know, it really provides the most widely recognized and used um, method for figuring out how to inventory your greenhouse gases. And we've seen that actually been kind of adapted into some of the standard setting that we talked about that's kind of ongoing right now. So both on an international front and then even around some of the domestic rulemaking that the SEC is looking at. So. Um, you, you generally follow kind of a, you know, a relatively four step process when you're thinking about calculating just your greenhouse gas emissions. So step one is first trying to figure out what's your baseline year. And that's obviously going to be used to then track your future emissions against to kind of see, hey, are we on trend? Are we improving? Like, where are we moving along? So having a baseline year really kind of sets that. Next is determining the facilities that you need to include in your inventory. So you'll often hear this referred to as like, what are your organizational boundaries that all kind of fall into the purview? After that, then it's figuring out the sources within all those kind of facilities within your organizational boundaries, which you'll often hear people for, refer to as just figuring out what are your operational boundaries. And then once you've kind of sorted out organizational and operational boundaries, the next is to then measure. So you'll follow some type of standardized and accepted methodology to calculate, you know, greenhouse gas emissions for all the ones that you identified from each of your sources. Okay. And I know you touched on this just briefly, but explain to me the purpose of base year serves. Yeah. So to do this, companies will generally inventory data for a full year of their operating activities and, and to make that information the most high quality and actually create a meaningful comparison, you, you're probably going to pick a more recent year. So, you know, for example, if you got a company that's looking to report on, you know, carbon accounting emissions matters starting in 2023, it probably makes sense to use your 2022 as your kind of baseline year as being the most recent. Okay. Now, I know that you mentioned this earlier that the GHG protocol established ways to classify various GHG that may be applicable to a company. Yep. But can we talk a bit about those and how they may impact the GHG inventory process? Yeah. So emissions are going to be classified according to their scope. And when you think about scopes, you can kind of think about them as being different levels of emissions. Um, you know, some that'll occur directly under the company's control, and then there'll be others that are just within a company's value chain that are outside their direct control. And, you know, we mentioned earlier, there's three scopes of emissions that, you know, all of your inventory greenhouse gases will fall into. So scope one is going to be your most direct emission. So things that are owned or controlled by the company um, that come from sources that the company has. So their own vehicles, their own manufacturing facilities, et cetera. Uh, scope two includes all indirect emissions, but they're from the generation of 
kind of electricity from steam, heating, cooling that kind of impact the, the organization, the company itself. And then the most broad of them all is scope three. Um, and this includes kind of all the other indirect emissions. And if you actually look into the GHG protocol, there's essentially 15 different categories in total that fall within scope three. Um, but to summarize that, you know, more largely, you can kind of think of things that are like upstream in your value chain and things that are downstream in your value chain. So upstream could be emissions that come from the sourcing, production, transportation of raw materials and components that a company might use in its operations. It can also include things like business travel, employees just commuting day to day to work or their, you know, their manufacturing facilities and waste generated by the company or assets that are leased. And then on the downstream side, you can have emissions that are from kind of the logistical use and disposal of your products. Uh, but they can also include things like investing and franchising as well. Okay. So Fabian, I want to bring it back over to you. Speaking of these emissions and scoping, how does an entity define its organizational boundaries? Sure. So good question. First, let's address, there's two types of boundaries. There are organizational boundaries. And then to what Adam just touched on, there are operational boundaries. So let's talk about the distinction between the two. Organizational boundaries define the operations, the facilities, and assets that are to be included in your GHG inventory. In contrast, your operational boundaries categorize those emissions either as direct or indirect from the organization's operations. Now, establishing organizational boundaries is not always easy, but it is necessary as these boundaries determine which entities, such as subsidiaries, joint ventures, or partnerships, and which assets, facilities, or vehicles are going to be included in your Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions inventory. Now, in setting organizational boundaries, an organization will choose an approach for consolidating greenhouse gas emissions and then will consistently apply that approach to define the entities and the assets that are going to be included in its scope one and scope two inventory. The greenhouse gas protocol or the protocol as Adam mentioned uh, will define three consolidation approaches, equity share and then control approach, which is actually broken down into two, either financial control or operational control. So let's talk about each of those. Under the equity share, an, organiza an organization will account for greenhouse gas emissions from operations and assets according to its share of equity in that operation. So it could be a percentage ownership. The equity re share reflects economic interest, which is the extent uh, of rights an organization will have to the risk and rewards uh, flowing from an, from an operation. Now, let's talk about the control approach. Again, this is broken out into financial and operational control. So under financial control, uh, an organization will account for 100% of the greenhouse gas emissions over which it has financial control over. It does not account for GHG emissions from operations it owns an equity share in, but does not have financial control over that. The organization has financial control over the operation if it can direct the operation's financial and operating policies in order to gain economic interest or benefits from the operation's activities. Now, the organization may have financial control over an operation, even if it has less than 50% equity in that operation. It all comes down to how you schedule or how you uh, build out your business agreement. Now, let's talk about operational control. An organization will account for 100% of the greenhouse gas emissions over which it has operational control. Similar to financial control, it does not account for greenhouse gas emissions from those operations if it owns an equity share, but it does not have operational control over it. Generally, an organization will have operational control if it has the full authority to introduce and implement uh, the organization's operating policies. So Adam, how do companies determine which approach to use or are there certain approaches more common than others? You know, obviously there's options there and it really kind of just depends like which approach to use, especially when it comes to voluntary reporting. I think there's more flexibility and maybe how, um, you know, certain organizations or companies decide to include which, you know, which greenhouse gases into their scope one and two emissions. Uh, you know, operational control approach for, you know, example might be used by some because they might view it best aligns with what an actual organization feels they're really responsible for. Um, on the other hand, you know, you companies or industries that maybe have more complex ownership structures, you know, they may be more likely to follow kind of that equity share approach that Fabian outlined. 
um, which better kind of aligns with the reporting boundaries with the actual stakeholder interests. And then, you know, thirdly, you know, organization may choose to use either the equity share or a lot of times that financial control share approach because it really kind of aligns with maybe how they view their own financial reporting. And so, you know, by parallel, they kind of view carbon accounting and financial reporting kind of in the same lane. So they maybe want to keep organizational boundaries aligned with that. Um, the only thing I would probably like highlight on organizational boundaries, especially, and you know, we keep referring back to all the recent rulemaking and standard setting that's kind of in progress or being finalized as we're recording this now, is that, you know, if a company is going to be pulled into specific sustainability reporting requirements, um, nearly all of them are going to have kind of explicit ways to think about determining organizational boundaries and, and good or bad uh, between all the different rules that people might be pulled into the scope of those organizational boundary determinations don't align so they can have differences and so i think it's important for companies where there are being kind of subject to a specific sustainability reporting standard or regulatory rule that they actually look at the rule and make sure they understand you know how is organizational boundaries prescribed by the rule itself okay I want to talk about scope three emissions. How do boundaries work for those? Yeah. So as we mentioned, like scope three is kind of that broader, like all encompassing category. Um, but really to even like start thinking about scope three, you really have to settle what falls into your scope one and scope two organizational boundary. Um, and then once that's set, you can really then start thinking about the actual activities upstream and downstream that would qualify as a scope three emission. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind, too, is if you are trying to comply with the GHG protocol, like there is a requirement to report all relevant scope three categories. Um, you know, I think now today where people might be reporting voluntarily on this stuff, you know, they may choose not to include scope three because, quite frankly, it's it's a challenging exercise mm -hmm. to even just start inventorying and then quantifying. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a tough hurdle to get over. Um, but that being said, like, if you kind of think about the scope three sources, like one thing that's interesting about it is they actually may represent most of the organization's actual greenhouse gas emissions. It comes from that scope three upstream downstream value chain. Um, and because of this, it actually maybe provides a lot of companies or organizations the best opportunity to reduce their emissions. Um, and, and what I mean by that is because, you know, even though these emissions aren't under their direct control, um, companies are actually going to probably have a lot of influence on their scope three emissions because they could make determinations of we may select certain suppliers or we may work with certain vendors or whatever that better align with our own practices or help us get to achieving any types of goals or mandates that may be out there. Um, they have the ability to kind of influence that themselves. Okay. So Fabian, I want to talk to you next about after a company is sorted through its GHG inventory assessment, where do they go next? How does that work? Sure. So once you establish your organizational boundaries, once you identify a complete listing of all your sources of emissions, and then once you qualify them as direct versus indirect, the next step is to gather the necessary data and begin the company's process of the emissions calculations themselves. So every company is going to be a little bit different. They're going to have different data to gather uh, depending on the industry or the nature of the business. Uh, but some of the most common data that we've seen can be things like the types of fuel used. It can be gasoline, diesel, propane, coal. Uh, you can have quantity of fuel combusted, right? Things uh, measured in gallons, fuel purchases, types of vehicles, small cars, trucks, boats, trains, etc. Uh, mileage driven. If you have a fleet, how are you tracking your mileage? You want to make sure you get up in front of that. Uh, facility energy usage, right, for scope two electricity emissions. Uh, one of the ways you can get this data is through utility bills, and it'll typically come uh, measured in the form of kilowatt or megawatt hours for each facility. So this is going to be the internal data from your operations. So another input to your emissions calculation is going to be the use of emissions factors. Factors. An emissions factor is a value that attempts to relate the quantity of a greenhouse gas emitted into the atmosphere uh, with an associated activity uh, that has a release of that greenhouse gas. So for example, 
if you combust five gallons of diesel fuel, you would then apply an emissions factor to it to figure out how much that five gallons of uh, released of CO2 into the atmosphere. Fabian, where do we get these emissions factors from? Sure, so you can get them from the EPA website, which has a large uh, uh, emissions factors inventory, or you can get them from other international or domestic agencies. Okay, so after we have the factor, what's next? Okay, after you have a factor, then you can begin to calculate your GHG emissions. So the calculation will vary depending on uh, company, industry, and then what data you have available. Uh, so in order to make your calculation, the EPA prescribes th four different tiers of emissions calculations that you can use based on which, which data you have. So depending on your available data, some of these calculations will give you a more precise number of emissions as compared to others. For example, if all you have is fuel quantity, then you can use a tier one calculation, which gives you a default high heating value and a default emissions factor. But if you happen to know the carbon content of your fuel, you can use a tier three calculation, which will give you a more accurate emissions number because you have that detailed granular data. Uh, one last thing uh, to note here is to ensure that you're not double counting your emissions. For example, ensure not to double count fuel used for stationary sources uh, and then mobile emission sources. So if you're pulling data from your system or you used purchase data and you're saying, hey, I bought a thousand gallons of, of diesel fuel this past year, make sure that you're applying that fuel uh, in appropriate manner to both uh, stationary combustion sources and mobile combustion sources, not to use that same number for both. Okay. Now, Fabian, a lot of information we're trying to capture here, a lot of various inputs. Any specific tools out there that can help with these calculations and capturing this information? Yeah, sure. So to start off, you can utilize the Greenhouse Gas Protocol and the EPA website, which has a library of emissions factors and they have useful calculation tools. Uh, you can also use the Greenhouse Gas Protocol's calculation tools uh, because they are reviewed and regularly updated. But most companies will probably end up using multiple tools to uh, cover all their greenhouse gas emission sources. Additionally, I suggest seeking guidance from sector-specific guidelines, such as from industry trade associations. And an example of this would be the uh, API or the American Petroleum Institute, which offers guidance specifically in the energy sector. But there are others out there. Okay, helpful, very much, uh, Adam. I, you know. I think that there's a lot of changes year over year, and I can imagine the managing this inventory and some of the changes uh, to a company's GHG makeup alone is a challenge. Talk to me a little bit about that. Uh, that's a good point. You know, if you just think about your emissions one year to your emissions next year, right? There could be new types of things that are pulled into the inventory. And then, you know, Fabian just kind of walk through a bunch of factors that go into the calculation. So emission factors, those things are constantly changing and being updated. So there's, there's definitely a project management process that's just necessary to kind of keep reporting on this, you know, period over period. And so, you know, it, it it's for sure prudent that companies that are kind of stepping into carbon accounting is to establish some type of inventory management program of their own just to kind of keep this all together and and up to speed um and, and an inventory management program is going to help you know companies answer questions like you know what facilities do we include in inventory what sources are included you know who in our organization maybe even has some other information if i'm trying to like figure it out for next year like who did we get it from last year um, how do we account for if we've added new factories or we brought on new vehicles or got rid of certain vehicles, like just maintaining like where all the different sources of your emissions exist. Um, having some type of standardized central program will help really kind of facilitate the efficiencies that you'll need in order to report timely on a lot of this stuff. Okay. And Adam, are there any key components of a typical inventory management plan that we need to talk through? Yeah, there are. And, you know, we've we've alluded to the, you know, the EPA um, as being a source for a lot of this information, you know, definitely encourage people check that out. I'm sure there's other regulatory um, agencies, you know, both domestically and abroad that also provide um, information. But the EPA actually has kind of a, a robust process for like thinking about what you need to include as you're kind of creating your inventory management program. Um, and so definitely encourage people to check out some of the, the more detailed information there, but just some of the things that kind of stood out to me, 
um, as, as some of their recommendations. So like, you know, a, a typical program will have information around just your boundary conditions. So, you know, emission sources that should be included in that inventory. It's going to obviously vary based on the organizational boundaries we talked about. So, you know, a, a good program is going to have a list of all those operations facilities in the inventory based on the chosen boundary, as well as the procedures that were used to identify each operation or facility. Um, it'll also have like a list of the types of GHGs that are emitted at each of those different facilities that you identify. So just kind of having that kind of historical listing um, and a process to update that historical listing is important. Um, another big component is around emissions quantification. So again, this is just like some central repository that really kind of explains all the different methodologies or factors that you chose or used um, to create the estimates of all your emissions. So you kind of have a source document on where to find that stuff. You know, another one could just be around like data management. So just having kind of a description, like I said, of the data sources that are used, where they came from, um, how that data is maintained. Um, will be definitely important as you kind of just think through calculations year over year. Yeah, great points there, Adam. So Fabian, at the start of our conversation, we noted that many companies have set goals as it relates to their emissions reductions. Can we talk about setting some of these targets and measuring against those targets for goals? Definitely, Zach. So as part of the carbon accounting process, companies should set a greenhouse gas emissions reduction target and then plan and track uh, report against that target. So as mentioned earlier, companies should establish a baseline year to measure progress against. And so baseline year will, will be established based on, you know, kind of what data you have. What is the best year that you can set based on the most reliable data that you have? So an example of this is the SBTI or the Science-Based Target Initiative. So this is an initiative brought forth by the World Resources Institute, which defines and promotes best practices in emissions reductions and and net zero targets in line with climate science, and it provides target setting methods and guidance to companies uh, to set science-based targets in line with the latest climate science. So amongst other criteria, your targets should be specific, they should be quantifiable and measurable, and they should be periodically reviewed. So having reliable information of your emissions can help you focus your resources uh, on activities that result in the most cost-effective greenhouse gas reductions to work towards your set targets. Okay. Now, Fabian, we've covered a lot of information here today, and quite frankly, uh, I, I'm still trying to get up to speed on a lot of it. Um, and it doesn't sound like this is going to be an easy undertaking for a lot of companies. Can you talk about some of the unique challenges, limitations um, as we're thinking through carbon accounting? Definitely. There's plenty of those. So greenhouse gas accounting faces a number of challenges and limitations. So one area where challenges exist is around the uncertainty uh, in emissions estimates, identifying what information is material to your company, uh, and then the use of alternate standards, right, which can affect the comparability across organizations. Also, uh, the lack of third-party verification is another challenge, right? Let's touch on something else, which is lack of available data. Having reliable data is key when you're trying to measure your emissions. So ensuring that your company has all the necessary data is crucial to ensuring you have a complete and accurate greenhouse gas inventory. Without proper data, you're most likely going to have to make assumptions and estimates to arrive at emissions numbers that are not necessarily going to be as accurate as those if you did have the proper data. So because of data, uh, you can have uh, collection methods uh, that could be skewed and could affect your company. It could affect your emissions reduction projects. It could affect, in turn, investor decisions, uh, regulatory agency decisions. It can also distort perceptions of progress in reducing emissions if you have skewed data. Uh, and then let's move on to the big one that Adam was talking about earlier is scope three. So accurate scope three uh, reporting is also a particular challenge, right? These emissions can be several times greater than your scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, lack of high quality data can affect the accuracy of scope three estimates and gathering this data from your supply chain can be particularly troublesome uh, because some of your vendors may or may not be gathering this data for you to utilize. Uh, there can be inconsistencies in the way they gather it, and this is going to affect your scope three emissions accuracy. Okay. Yeah, and I would just layer on quickly too, just talking about like availability of data and quality of the data is, is you know, 
again, kind of pulling in some of the, the standard setting that's going on and the rulemaking is those are going to ultimately require a level of assurance as well around a lot of this information. So a lot of them starting off with limited assurance and then moving to kind of reasonable assurance over time. It just also adds increased pressure just to make sure that the information you are using to then produce a lot of these calculations, disclosures, et cetera, um, are scrutinized even more because you're going to have essentially kind of an independent auditor reviewing a lot of this information and ensuring that it also is reasonable and correct. Yeah. Uh, Adam, anything else that we need to touch on before we, we wrap up? Yeah, I guess the only other thing I'd highlight, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of the, uh, the sustainability Bible. So the greenhouse gas protocol, Mm -hmm. um, and how that really, you know, interplays with a lot of, uh, voluntary reporting today, but it also, you know, it's a, it's a key component of a lot of the rulemaking that's been put forth. It's, you know, they've tried to, uh, use a lot of interoperability of the greenhouse gas protocol and establishing rules by the ISSB, by the SEC, as well as in, in the EU. So just recognizing, I guess, the importance of the protocol, you know, they, they actually recently opened up an invitation just for stakeholders to respond on their need to update their standards and guidance, recognizing that it's going to continue to be an important piece of the conversation and, and kind of furthering carbon accounting and reporting. Um, so that has been opened up and, you know, they, they basically sent out a series of surveys for people to respond on. And there's been a lot of, a lot of movement and a lot of interest there. So definitely something to kind of keep in mind and watch and to see kind of what changes they make and enhancements they might make to the existing kind of, uh, protocol standards. Okay. Well, Adam, Fabian, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate both of your time, the insight you guys provided, uh, to our listeners. I hope you enjoyed this accounting matters podcast on carbon accounting and we will see you next time. 